Uh, welcome, everybody. It's nice to see you all. And uh, we're honored to have a distinguished Berkeley alumnus here today. In fact, uh, he comes from a dynasty of, of Berkeley graduates, with his grandfather and his sister. And so um, our guest is the, uh, from the US Army Corps of Engineers, Major General Don T. Riley. And he's going to give the talk that we have the title up on the screen. I'm going to say a few words about the, the Corps of Engineers. It has about as many people in it as we do at UC Berkeley. Uh, however, it has a little bit larger budget, 20 times ours. Uh, and it, it's almost unimaginably complex. Uh, their mission crosses multiple sectors and industry boundaries, from water resources, which I think we'll hear about, to military infrastructure. And of course, they, they work in the full spectrum of operations from our peacetime concerns to wartime concerns. I think it's, it's really hard to appreciate the complexity and diversity of the, an organization like the Corps that supports our country. Um, we have great challenges in all our public institutions. Uh, and when Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Breslauer and I met with uh, Major General Riley this afternoon, we exchanged our, our mutual challenges in, in managing public institutions and, and the, uh, the difficulties we both, we both face. Um, I think we all have to step up to the challenge of, of supporting our public institutions, whether they're, they're uh, federal or state supported. In, in addition to meeting with us, um, General Riley met with the College of, en of Environmental Design, the Haas School of Business, the College of Engineering, and the Berkeley Water Resources Center. So we did our usual and uh, showed him a small fraction of all of the uh, things that go on here. And I hope that this will be a beginning of a, of a productive relationship. Um, and so we thank General Riley for his leadership in coming to Berkeley uh, and getting a glimpse into the depth, depth and breadth of our intellectual and academic resources. Um, and we're ready on our campus. I think everybody feels our, our, uh, it's a part of our mission to uh, be as involved as possible in the major issues of, of our time. And we're ready to, to help in a meaningful way. So I'm now going to uh, stop and introduce someone most of you know, Dean Shankar Sastry, who will introduce General Riley. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. Good evening, everybody. I'm really pleased to join you all today to welcome you to the College of Engineering. And I'm especially honored to welcome and introduce our special guest speaker today, our distinguished alumnus, Major General Don Riley. Major General Riley became the Deputy Commanding General and Deputy Chief of Engineers April 1st, 2008. That means that he is second in command of the US Army Corps of Engineers. And just to flesh out the numbers that uh, Graham was talking about, 37,000 employees, an annual budget of uh, 40 billion. Of course, our budget really pales in comparison with. Uh, uh, General Riley's previous assignment was as the Director of Civil Works, the US Army Corps of Engineers. And as Director of Civil Works, he managed the Army's Civil Works program as the nation's primary planner, designer, builder, and operator of flood control, navigation, environmental restoration, and multipurpose water resource projects. So we will really look forward to hearing his insights on the management of a large public engineering organization. He is a native of Hayward, California. He's a graduate of the US Military Academy, West Point where he was commissioned in 1973. He earned a master's degree in civil and environmental engineering, and the civil and environmental engineering, and Lisa, as, as chair, is especially proud to welcome him back. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome, or I should probably say welcome back, General Riley to your alma mater. We are pleased and honored to have you here. I, I, I just need to make one announcement uh, for, qu for the question and answers that follow. Uh, there will be folks, and the folks are here, who will be passing out little cream-colored cards. And what we'd like to do is, if you could write down 
as elaborate a question as you want. And uh, Graham has the pleasant duty of integrating multiple questions into a few select ones so that we can have a efficient question and answer period. So please pass them back during the talk or after the talk and we'll be collected around 20 past. Be collected around 20 past. OK, thank you very much. I'll really get off. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Sostry and Vice Chancellor Fleming. What, what a great opportunity to, uh, to return to Berkeley and, and speak to both engineering and business students and faculty. And it's great to see friends. I, I, I invited my mom here tonight uh, from Livermore, California. <laughs> yeah. uh, dad, dad was born and raised in Berkeley and worked at the Livermore Berkeley and Lawrence Laboratories for 35 years. So a lot of Berkeley history in our in our family and good friends, uh, Rob and Madeline Heal, uh, I, I, almost lifelong friends. It goes a long time back. I also invited uh, Major General retired Jim Ellis and his wife uh, Merith, a former boss of mine, former uh, uh, district and division commander in the Corps of Engineers, and and now uh, living here in Oakland, uh, California. So, uh, what a great evening! You know, I always wanted my mom to hear a great introduction of myself, and so uh, we finally. Finally was able to make that happen. Uh, uh, but you know, you can't let that go to your head. There's a, there's a story of three POWs uh, that were captured and were in front of the uh, firing squad. One was a private, one was a general, and one was a crusty old command sergeant major that's been around a while. And the, the captain of the firing squad gave them each a, their last wish. And so a typical army private, his, his last wish was a uh, six-pack of Bud Light and, uh, and a big steak dinner. So the captain said, well, I can, I can grant that. And then, uh, then he decided to turn to the general and said, uh, uh, General, what would you like as your last wish? And he said, I'd like to speak to all my troops one last time. So the firing squad commander said, that'll be a little bit difficult, but we'll work it. Then he turned to the crusty old experienced sergeant major that's been around a long time and said, Sergeant Major, what would you like? is your last wish. And he said, shoot me before the general starts talking. <laughs> so, so I know, especially uh, for your, you students that are here on an evening function, I know uh, this is uh, how many of, I'm not sure how many of you are here to listen to the general talk. You may want to shoot me afterwards. But, uh, but thanks for uh, taking your time to do this. You know, I, I asked uh, the staff to help, help work these, this presentation in their Initial draft, they gave me 80 slides and uh, for about a 45-minute discussion. So we're down to 20 slides. It, it's not 80. And, uh, and I'll try to work through uh, at least the front piece uh, fairly quickly so we can get to the meat of it. But I do want to engage in a dialogue in the, in the question and answer period. And you may have some tough questions for the Corps of Engineers, so, uh, so fire away. And I'll just give it my best shot. I got some of the, I got uh, Dr. Todd Bridges here. He's our uh, the Army's chief scientist for environmental science, and Mr. Tim Daniels is our the Corps of Engineers uh, uh, director of strategy and integration. And uh, Mr. Scott Nicholson here is a PhD student right here at Berkeley, uh, working for the Corps of Engineers. So I do have some help with me, uh, but I want to try to stretch your thinking a little bit as we uh, as we look at the. Uh, I want to first give you a little bit of context about the Corps of Engineers. I don't want to dwell on that too much, but I want to explain to you what the, you know, what the core is like and what we're doing. And then a uh, little bit about the world we face and how it impacts our national responsibilities. But uh, more importantly, to end it with, well, what are we doing about that? We, we face difficult challenges, just as you do, and as you students will, as you get out into the uh, <laughs> business world. Uh, but what are we doing about it? Not just to respond to the challenges, but what are we doing to anticipate those challenges? Uh, and so for a little bit of the history, you know, a lot of people ask uh, when I speak, uh, they say, why is the general talking to us about locks and dams or navigation or flood control? Uh, well, it began, it is well, it's well rooted in our history. Uh, we started in 1794 by building coastal fortifications. That's when Congress said Army, and they authorized the funds to do that. But then in 1824, there was a case where they fought over, two shippers fought over navigation in the New York, New Jersey Harbor. 
And so this case went all the way uh, to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said navigation, interstate navigation, is a federal responsibility. So they gave that to the only body of engineers at the time, and that was produced out of West Point, which President Jefferson founded in 1802. So immediately the Army now has a navigation mission. And then as time goes on, uh, we collect more missions. Uh, the Great Flood of 1927 in the Mississippi Valley, 1928 Flood Control Act, we got the mission for uh, flood control. Later on, aquatic eco ecosystem restoration. Whereas you look at other agencies in the federal government, they're, they all have founding legislation that says this is, we're gonna found this agency and this is what they are responsible to do. Ours were born out of the responsibilities of the Army and grew over the years. And uh, they're, they're quite expansive. I mean, we do a lot of work for Department of Homeland Security. We just completed the border fence on the, uh, the, with the border with Mexico. They just asked us to build border stations on our border with Canada. Department of Energy, we completed a, uh, a plutonium processing plant in Russia this year uh, where we're taking the weapons grade fuel, processing that into, uh, into peaceful fuel. And uh, DOE has asked us to do a couple more of those plants right here in the United States. EPA, we do about $300 million worth of work for EPA as well. So our mission is really a compilation of missions that uh, built up over the years. The, uh, we have uh, several major programs in the Corps of Engineers, uh, three major programs, military, civil, and R&D, and then several other missions. So let me just uh, take you through this uh, for just a few minutes. This first one in uh, military construction, we really are, for the business students, much like a diverse conglomerate where we have major programs. Each one have different business lines. Military program, for instance, has five different business lines. And it's, so it's, uh, we have people working in over 30 countries around the world right now and are engaged in over 90 countries providing support. The uh, Civil Works program, has uh, nine business lines in it. And you can see that's pretty varied. Uh, people, many times, we usually find ourselves in the middle of a fight somewhere when it comes to the regulatory piece on uh, the Clean Water Act. But Congress, when they passed the Clean Water Act, had a choice of which agency to regulate that. They came to the Corps of Engineers. Now, you might ask why. I'd probably have to go back to Congress to ask to get the answer to that. But they essentially wanted an agency that could, uh, that, uh, could balance many competing requirements as we had done in the past. And, and then if you look at our research and development, we have six different laboratories around the United States. This really is uh, an American treasure, a true jewel, uh, where these people and these laboratories do tremendous work, and I'll have a little bit of explanation about that, a few examples of the kind of work that they do. Several of our other important missions are uh, the real estate. We are Department of Defense's a uh, real estate agent. So if you, in many of your towns, you'll see a recruiting station. Well, we're the real estate agent for that. We go lease that facility. Uh, for the border fence uh, on uh, the border with Mexico, the reason Department of Homeland Security came to us is because we, uh, we had the real estate capability uh, for Department of Defense. Uh, we had the regulatory authority to, for the Clean Water Act and navigation. And then we had the construction management capability. So we had in one agency multiple capabilities, and that's why they ended up coming to us, to get the work done very, very quickly under a very tight uh, suspense, as you might imagine. And then Homeland Security as well. Of course, being in the Army, this is a fully appropriate mission to us. Uh, but you know, we have uh, quite a bit. We have over $2 billion worth of, of uh, facilities and infrastructure around the United States. I'm sorry, 200 billion. When it comes to the locks and dams, all those major facilities, you can imagine that that cost goes up quickly. And then lastly, uh, we have uh, interagency support. And I mentioned some of the work we do and we, we're doing for the interagency. Typically though, uh, we find ourselves in the middle of a controversy somewhere. Because uh, our job is to balance many competing requirements, especially when you get to water resources and uh, the civil works. And so, uh, we're typically criticized quite often. We often feel ourselves as the, uh, you, you remember Russell Crowe with the movie The Gladiator, out there in the middle of a public, public hearing, we're, 
we're usually getting beat up from all sides, which is for us is good news, uh, because we're and when we're doing that, then we're we're reaching a balanced solution. <laughs> if uh, if not, if not, then we know we've got trouble. So our guys uh, have a thick skin and a lot of a uh, lot of experience at that. Take a look at uh, some of that's the overall. That just to give you an idea of the kind of conglomerate we run. So it's not a it's not a simple matter if you try to turn this agency on a dime. You can't. Uh, we, uh, we are not as agile as a private business. Uh, we have to go to the administration and Congress for any authorities and appropriations, of course. So greater, greater difficulty, greater level of difficulty when you get into a public institution. Just like here at Berkeley. I mean, the state helps out a lot. You get private funding. You have different funding sources. Just a few more examples. Here's some of the work we do. Uh, inter internationally, we, and, and the work we do internationally is typically for Department of Defense or State Department or U.S. Uh, Agency for Internal Development. It's to advance our national security objectives. We do have full-time liaisons with all the military commands, with the State Department, with USAID, and in London for our research and development, and other places around the world. Uh, for instance, we have uh, one of our our director of our civil works program, Mr. Steve Stockton, is a member of the uh, or member of the board of the World Water Council. He's uh, meeting with them uh, later on this month in uh, Marseille, France, and so uh, we're engaged quite heavily with many organizations around the world. With the United Nations, uh, we are involved in their IHP, the International Hydraulic Program, or their water programs around the world, and UNESCO. Our Institute for Water Resources has just been designated as an international center for integrated water resources management uh, by the UNESCO. And this year, or this, this month, uh, they're voting in Paris uh, whether to authorize that as a UN center. Millennium, uh, or the Millennium Challenge Corporation, we work uh, closely with them. Also, the Mekong River Commission has asked for a partnership, our partnership with us in our Mississippi River Commission. So we have a lot of international engagement, again, to advance international uh, efforts and national security objectives. Uh, let me just give you an example of our research and development. Two examples here. I could, there are hundreds and hundreds of examples, and I'm sure Dr. Todd Bridges could give even more in the environmental field. Uh, but this is uh, one of the work we do in phys physical security, and the uh, what we've done in the, what we did in the Pentagon, and this was uh, you can see this picture. 300 feet north of the impact on 9-11 of this airplane. Uh, we had just finished one wedge of the Pentagon, though, and uh, with our protective technology of windows and walls, and 50 feet uh, north of the impact, uh, this was the office with that technology. So uh, we're, we're using this around the world, uh, around certainly to protect our own infrastructure and then our military infrastructure overseas and uh, to keep uh, and securing bridges and facilities around the United States. Another example on the environmental side is our threatened and endangered species. What you see there on the left side is a red cockaded woodpecker. Uh, over 100,000 acres of our training lands were uh, off limits not too long ago, within the last 10 years, uh, to protect the red cockaded woodpecker. We, we, found, we saw a great decline in that woodpecker uh, over uh, in the United States. And they, because they nested in old pine forests. Where do you find old pine forests? You find them in national parks and you find them on military lands. So we sequestered all that to protect the nest. Our research and development folks though went out and found out that it wasn't a disturbance by military vehicles that were disturbing, it was feral animals. So feral cats, for instance. So we built a feral resistant nest and now we've got about 80,000 acres back that we can train in because we were finding uh, an imp impact on our readiness. We couldn't train as we should uh, properly. Similarly, you see some other species there, the, such as the golden cheek warbler. We found their nests were decreasing. It was threatened and endangered. We found the reason for that was fire ants. So we, we, we found a way to control the fire ants, and now those species are all coming back. The, the, the woodpecker, species has come back so well now that we're importing those into national parks as well. California tortoises is another one, and uh, sea turtles and frogs and bats and others in uh, other caves and locations that we're protecting around the 
United States. So that just gives you a little bit of sense of uh, the broad range and the variability of our responsibilities given to us by Congress and then other agencies come to us uh, for help as well. Uh, a little bit about, uh, now enough about you know, what the core is, because it just gives you a, a little base of knowledge. But I want to take a look now at what we're facing uh, both internationally and domestic. And, and then in the broad context, and we all I think are facing those same sort of challenges. And then I'll talk uh, more specifically about our two major mission areas, uh, both water resources and environment. Uh, this uh, next slide gives uh, some idea of the international environment. Y you know these. Uh, you've heard them all. You read them all. And they're not unique to the Corps, but they do have an impact on our mission. Of course, we have a challenge with uh, non-state actors now, where uh, it used to be purely state actors. Uh, the weapons of mass destruction, we don't know what Iran has. Uh, not quite sure what North Korea has, or more importantly, what they're going to do with them. Uh, the world economy, of course, is much more integrated than it was previously. And uh, the, the actions we take or the actions that China take has a much, much greater impact than they used to. And of course, the climate. We're dealing with the climate. Our problem with, with our infrastructure is how are we going to adapt to changing climate uh, to sea level rise. And so we have a program uh, now to look at all of our infrastructure to make sure that we can adapt to foreseeable uh, future outcomes of the of changes in climate. Science and technology, uh, there's of course an increase in complexity around the world, and but with every piece, every piece of that complexity in S&T comes opportunity. So there is good news, but there are security threats. Of course, the World Wide Web and the Internet, uh, we have uh, severe challenges uh, with uh, states like China probing our Internet all the time. And biological weapons, uh, the threat uh, has increased substantially because of the simple nature of those weapons and, and the, uh, the, uh, the simplicity of dispersal as well. And then when you get into ethnic uh, fractions, factions, you have what you, what you have a greater challenge with is emotions, whereas we're more than just state pride where it used to be, and national pride, now you have greater emotions and religious emotions involved as well, and then our national demand increasing for natural resources all around the world. And domestically, uh, of course, patterns are changing domestically as well. And with rain patterns changing, we don't know where, the, well, we're, where we will have drought or where we will have floods. So again, we need to be adaptable to those. The stimulus bill passed earlier this year. A lot of funds went out on that. We have, we have uh, placed projects very, very quickly this year. And uh, we had to build up our staff quite substantially to do so. The infrastructure problem we have in the United States, you know, the American Society of Civil Engineers recently graded the infrastructure a D in the United States and put a price tag of $2.2 trillion to repair that infrastructure around the United States. Now, a very difficult challenge. On Monday, I'll meet with the uh, ASCE and the Industry Leaders Council, and uh, we'll talk about uh, what we do as, a, as an engineering society then uh, to help improve that situation. You know, in, in the, with the federal budget deficit, GAO has written a report that projects in uh, 2040 that we will only be able to pay our interest payments on the debt and Social Security. There won't be any more money for Medicare, Medicaid, or any other discretionary budget such as the Defense Department. So our situation now and projections of the federal budget are pretty severe unless uh, the nation takes some action. And then uh, the last point on uh, the educational competitiveness. You know that better than I do being here. But our interest, of course, in the Corps of Engineers is in the STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and, and math uh, programs that make sure uh, that we graduate enough of those folks that we can uh, support the nation. Uh, let me talk about uh, the challenges of our two major programs, and then I'll talk, uh, then we'll move into what the Corps is doing about it. First of our two major missions, of course, is our water resources. The uh, population, the Census Department projects by 2050 we'll have 440 million people in the United States. Right now in the world, we have 900 million people without water. 
without clean water. Now we've got a huge challenge to restore and main, maintain the environment, not just, not just in a sustainable way, but to re do a lot of restoration work on uh, the environment that has been degraded because of uh, some infrastructure challenges. We also have, as I mentioned earlier, changing rainfall patterns. And we don't know what surprise we'll have next when it comes to a flood or a drought. Our locks for our navigation that Congress gave us the mission back in 1824, uh, over half of those are past their 50-year design life. Many of them were built for 50 years. They're, they're working 70, 80, 90 years now. Our ports can't handle the larger ships, uh, but you got some good news locally. I mean, you just uh, increase the depth of the Oakland port in a very, uh, very environmentally sustainable way because you took the dredging material, we took the dredging material, we pumped it over to Fort Hamilton and restored the wetlands in Hamilton, uh, Hamilton Air Base across the bay. So we, ser we see in the future for the Corps of Engineers a lot more requirements and less funding sources. Not, like, not unlike what you're facing right here at the university. The other uh, point about uh, governance is uh, when it comes to water resources is water flow across state lines and federal jurisdictions. You have it here within the state, a governance challenge with water from the north to the south. <laughs> Typically state lines are along a river, so you have a governance challenge with water. We have western water laws that are different than the water in the east. So how do you govern all of the water resources that we do have? This next one, uh, let me move on to our other major mission area, and that's uh, the military construction. This is, of course, all going on when we are fighting two wars simultaneously. So that provides added pressure on the budget. And we also have a worldwide realignment of our forces. In the next four years, we will move from one base to another over 380,000 soldiers and family members. And that's, that, with our major base realignment and closure, that's going on right now. So a major movement of forces around the world. And for energy use, energy security, the Army's goal is not to uh, keep a lid on energy use, but actually to reduce our energy requirements. And so we are working very hard to do that. We, we are pretty, uh, pretty confident that we're, able to, we're going to be able to make good progress on reducing energy requirements, both in our installations and in our equipment. And then uh, we are moving beyond simply environmental compliance to sustainability of all the work that we do. And then the last point on capacity development, that, that's our international work. Uh, for our national security guidance, where we'll build the capacity, human capacity, social capacity, and infrastructure capacity of other nations so that that's not a, those nations are not a terrorist haven. So we have some work going on in that area. Uh, okay, enough about the core and, and the challenges we all face. Let's talk about how we are going about uh, dealing with these challenges. And what we're, in our work, in our strategic work, we're trying to look pretty deep into the future. And we want to be in, it, put ourselves in a position to anticipate and solve the problems that affect uh, society. We, we know that every time we look out deep into the future, though there's a great deal of uncertainty, we see a lot of complexity, and it's uh, very dynamic. And we also have learned that we need to be as adept in the engineered system, in the human dimension, as we are in the engineered system. So our approach is the band, uh, has been to solve our problems now in an anticipatory fashion as well as a systemic fashion, to look at not a project-by-project project basis, but to look at systems, and then do that collaboratively. And so that's one of the reasons for the trip here to Berkeley, is to talk about that collaboration that we can have. And to move from a model of uh, economic or just solely cost-benefit ratio to a balance of environmental considerations as well as economic considerations. So uh, we went about doing that uh, through this uh, methodology. Uh, in our, we've completed this work in our civil works program. We're now starting, uh, we're about halfway through in our military programs. But we try to look at about 30 years into the future, uh, which you know we can look probably Maybe when it comes to the weather, we can look several days. When it comes to the stock market, 
Uh, you probably can't look an hour out in the future. So you can imagine how uncertain it is uh, when we're attempting to look 30 years out. So what we did was build four wide-ranging scenarios uh, that uh, were plausible, not very likely, but plausible, based on possibly a larger federal government, a smaller federal government. Uh, greater wars, fewer wars. More terrorism, less terrorism. Greater weather changes, less weather changes. So four different wide-ranging scenarios. And then try to look at it in the future and say, given those four, four scenarios, uh, how can we net position the Corps of Engineers to best serve the nation? And what do we need to do in the next five years uh, to be in position to be successful at our work in the next 30? And of course, the uncertainty is great, but we looked at the capabilities that we need to build right now. So we built a program with goals, objectives, and actions that we can take right now to help get us in position to succeed out into the future. And, and there, of course, our intent is to anticipate so that we shape our own future rather than just respond to it. And if there's a, a strategic surprise out there, then we'll have to adapt to it. But what we're trying to do is look out and get ahead of some of the challenges that I just talked about earlier. So uh, some of the, what have we actually done? So that, that was our approach. You know, Peter Drucker said that uh, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence itself, it's to act with yesterday's logic. So what we're trying to do is, okay, what is, what is tomorrow's logic? Let's think ahead. Let's not base uh, what we're going to do in the future on looking at what we've done in the past, but to take a look out in the future and how we can adapt to that. Now, there are major legislative mandates that we need to comply with. You know of the... GIPRA, or the Government Performance uh, uh, Results Act, and the CFO Act, the Chief Financial Officer Act, that we must comply with those. And we've had uh, two major command-wide efforts. The first is our uh, command-wide, core-wide strategic plan that looked out in the future and is moving us towards the future. And then we have program strategic plans. So both our military and civil programs have plans as well to move them out in the future. But again, we don't want to be uh, creatures of circumstance. We're trying to create the circumstance for a core, and of course our work is for the nation. So this, uh, I don't expect you to read that, of course, uh, but that is uh, sort of our four major goals. We have our vision and our mission, commander's intent. That's all available on the web if any of you wanted to look at that in greater detail. And with each one of those goals, we have four objectives. But that's really a future look at what we do in uh, military, uh, civil, and what we do with our human capital as well, and what we do with Homeland Security. Uh, but for the first time, uh, we've taken what we developed at the enterprise level, and now at our regional commands, we have regional implementation plans. So they, will now, they now have plans to implement this, and with those plans, they have actions and they have metrics with each one of those. So now we can track that. And, and for our individuals in the Corps of Engineers, all 36,400 of those, uh, they will have in their individual employee performance plans, they will have their piece of the campaign plan. So the first time we'll have it from the corporate enterprise level, all driven all the way down through the individual level. You know. Uh, I don't know, out here in California, there's not too many hockey players probably, but some maybe from the Northeast there were. But you remember, uh, you all have heard of Wayne, Gret Ring Wayne Gretzky, the greatest. Uh, somebody asked him what made him great, and he says, I skate to where the puck is. And so uh, that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, we, can't, we can't look out 30 years. Uh, we can't forecast or predict. So that's why we looked at multiple scenarios. Uh, but we're trying to move to where that puck is going to be in, the, in our water resources, in our military, in our research, through our research and development program. So here's some of the things we're doing to take this uh, campaign plan now and put it into a transformative efforts in our programs. So for military construction, here's a, a few ideas on the, the kinds of things that we're doing. And I'll just scroll through these uh, fairly quickly. Uh, let me talk about the adaptable and sustainable facilities. All, we have set a standard in the Army that all the facilities we build will be lead silver. And so it will be environmentally 
uh, sustainable. Uh, we've built several of them, several buildings that are lead gold. We've now have completed two, at least, that I know of that are uh, lead platinum. And when you get at the lead platinum level, that's, you have to generate some of your own energy. So that's a bare minimum in the Army. And then uh, we're looking at this one on point on installation master planning. Typically in the past, we've built a barracks, we've built a, a, a vehicle maintenance facility, we may have built a fitness center or a child care center, but we haven't looked at the entire uh, master plan. I mean, we've, we've done master planning on installations, primarily looking at where they sit on an installation. Now we're looking at the, the entire uh, community and the families and the soldiers and the movements and the energy use across an installation. So we're making great progress, and we, in our, uh, we are the lead for the Army, and uh, in many ways DOD for installation master planning. $70 million last year alone went to master planning for our installations. Uh, standardization, uh, we're, we're working to standardize facility types. So all the barracks, we won't design a new barracks at every installation. We have a center of standardization for barracks. We have many centers of standardization for hospitals as well. Uh, and we just adapt it to the terrain, the geography, when we get there. And lastly, in our use of industry best practices, for instance, the, the building information model that we're using uh, for 3D design. So uh, we are working closely with industry in all these efforts to make sure we are using the best practices across the industry. Let me talk a little bit now about the uh, Civil Works program and what we're doing to transform our work in civil works. As I mentioned earlier, I, I mentioned a project by project approach. That's really um, how Congress appro uh, uh, authorizes our work and how they fund our work on a project by project approach. Uh, but what, what we need to give to them, though, is a more systematic look. And when it comes to water resources, that's a watershed view, watershed approach. So and I, when I think of uh, systems, I think of uh, space, function, time, and organization. So space it might be spatially across the geography. In the case of water resources, it would be a watershed. Uh, function system, it's not a single function. We're not designing a project in a watershed for solely flood control. It could be for uh, navigation as well. It could be for uh, aquatic ecosystem restoration. It could be for... Uh, water supply, it could be for, uh, for clean water or fish and wildlife habitat. So it's a multifunction approach. So in the California, if you're working in the Delta, if, we'll provide, if we provide technical assistance, which we do to that work in the Delta, whether it be for uh, levees, there's multiple functions there. You have a water supply challenge, you've got a, a fish and habitat challenge, a saltwater intrusion, you have navigation through the Delta as well. So that's the multifunction piece of a system. Uh, the third part I talked about was time. So in that, when I talk about that, I talk about the life cycle of a project. And so uh, typically in the past, uh, you, we may have had a project uh, that uh, we have enough funds to build and then we turn it over to the local sponsor to operate, maintain, and repair, and rehabilitate. Uh, but what we want to look at is what are the life cycle costs, first of it, and how do you sustain that then over the life cycle? And then the fourth component of the system is the organizational component of it. When you have, uh, when you take a system, you have different people uh, living there, and they have different uses and different desires, and there's an organizational component that you have to look at the system as well. So pretty challenging approach. It's not just a, a singular engineering technical approach. The second one is uh, risk-informed decision-making, That's and that's why I brought Dr. Todd Bridges to, with me as well. He's leading our effort uh, in many ways in this, where uh, we don't just look at, uh, typically in a flood control project, for instance, uh, design against a certain flood. Uh, we now look at what's the risk to human safety and set that as a priority, rather than just a cost-benefit ratio of the economic benefits of that flood, uh, what's the benefit to the people? And to, the, and, and to articulate the risk uh, to the people living in that flood-prone area. For instance, uh, subsequent to, to New Orleans in our, in our work, uh, we developed, uh, we looked at storms from 
25 year, five year storms up to 5,000 year storms. We have 63,000 hydrographs that were developed to take a, how to uh, understand the risk of all those storms, not just a single storm, uh, but all the storms that might possibly hit that area. Thirdly, and probably uh, one of the more dis difficult one is how do you communicate the risk to the people? And, and do that so that uh, the people are so well informed they can make their own decisions as to their risk. And risk, in this case, is a shared responsibility. Post New Orleans, people said to me, well, Corey, you told us we were protected. I'm not sure if we ever organizationally said that, but I can see how they got that thought. Because we, we had a storm, we, a design storm, we designed to get that storm when we put it in place. Of course, it was multiple projects over multiple years. Many of the projects were incomplete. But, they did, but the problem is, that the true essence of it is, they didn't understand their risk. Uh, when I, in my discussions with senior officials in the administration, I was asked, well, when you finish this work in New Orleans, will the people feel safe? Um, my answer was, I hope not, uh, because uh, they still have a tremendous residual risk. We will dramatically lower their risk, uh, but they're still living below sea level. You know, the problem in New Orleans, the, dip, the, the greatest depth of the water in, in Katrina, which is a 400-year storm, was 12 feet. If, they, if you get a heavy rainstorm and a, a major storm that comes into the Sacramento area, the depth of flooding in Natomas, just north of Sacramento, is 28 feet. They are living with, surrounded by levees in a bowl. And if that Sacramento ri River rises and breaches uh, that, they'll have an even greater problem than New Orleans did. So we're, we're considering societal factors in the work that we're doing in, in risk decision making and, and uh, risk communication. Lastly, this whole idea of of uh, professional and technical expertise. We're looking at, uh, one, our own internal expertise, but how to collaborate so that we get all the expertise of academia, industry, and international as well. And then, how do you, the challenge with, you might have a, uh, fill your organization with a lot of experts. We've hired over 2,400 people just this past year alone. Uh, but the problem is, how do you become a learning organization and transfer that knowledge throughout the organization? and so that the organization processes are in place and structured so that you're continually learning and improving the organization. You know, uh, when it comes to human safety and the environment, uh, the, the great environmentalist uh, Aldo Leopold wrote a, wrote a book called The Land Ethic, and that land ethic was a description of the responsibility of landowners and the stewardship responsibility they had to take care of that land. Um, but at the end of the book, he says, uh, he recognizes that development will always continue. So he said, he concluded, concluded the, his essay uh, by saying, we shall hardly relinquish the shovel, which after all has its many good points. What we are in need of are gentle, gentler and more objective criteria for its use. So that's what the Corps of Engineers is seeking, is a gentler and more objective criteria for the use of that shovel when it comes to development. Uh, one last uh, couple more pieces, and then we'll get to the question and answer period on uh, here's how we're, I told you how we're transforming the military construction program and the civil works. This is what some of the work we're doing in business transformation. For the business students here, I think the things you see up here are fairly common. Uh, but again, we're a public organization spread around internationally, funded uh, by, and budgeted for by the administration, funded by Congress. Uh, we can't turn on, on a dime, but we are transforming our business processes. This quality management system that we're putting in place, we have several of our regions that are ISO 9000 compliant or certified. Uh, we're doing this core-wide in a quality management system. We'll look at certification later if it comes, uh, but we're, we're trying to base that all on the same principles. Uh, but our global operation is complex, but we're working to how do we have centralized management, uh, but decentralized execution throughout all of our regions. So let me just illustrate on this next slide uh, one challenge we face in our organization. What you see in the upper left is a typical organization chart that you'd see in any organization. And uh, we have 36,000 people in the Corps of Engineers. 
Only about 500 of us are military. You know, the rest of the 35,000 plus are, are civilian. Great professional base of civilian uh, leadership and technicians and scientists. But it's hierarchical based. So we're organized uh, by region and we're organized uh, by function as well. But if you take a look at the, uh, at the uh, bottom right here, that's how we operate. We're really operating as a, as a matrix organization. It's sort of a, like a Rubik's Cube. So across the bottom you see our geographic regions. So we have the geographic regions around the United States and the world. And each one of those geographic region commanders are responsible for executing the program in their geographic region. Uh, but you see along the right side is our programs and business lines. I, I described to you three major programs, each with five, six, and nine business lines. They are responsible across all those regions to execute the program in their region. Then if you look along the, up at the upper left, the staff functions, typical staff functions that, uh, that, uh, that I operate in the headquarters are, of course, council, uh, human relations, internal review, uh, small business, uh, equal opportunity, uh, contracting, all of those functions, they're responsible for execution of their function as well. So if you're in the center of that cube somewhere, uh, this, in this, so you have a three-dimensional uh, leadership, you're looking in at least three different directions for your guidance. Uh, but within each one of those cubes, you have a community of practice. Uh, that also provides guidance to that community. So we always got a four-dimensional organization there. So it just shows the complexity. What may look simple on the, on the upper light, on the upper left, is much more of a difficult operation to control uh, and, and complex. But that's the right way to do it. You have to operate in a matrix fashion. The challenge we have then is the knowledge management across that organization and the communication and the, and the the, answering the question, who's responsible? Because you have all those responsible parties. So just uh, to sum up here in the last couple of slides, uh, and uh, what I wanted, part of the point I wanted to get across that uh, strategically speaking, engineering is an art. Uh, to run a large public engineering organization, it's not simply the, the technical aspect of an engineering there's a lot of art to it in the complexity of the business uh, sense. And there are no straightforward answers. You're always dealing with uh, multiple, multiple criteria. Each one of those criteria have multiple attributes, attributes, and each one of those attributes are changing over time. So you have a complex situation. You don't have a uh, where you can use a calculator or a computer to spit out your answers. You have a technical dimension, and then you have a human dimension as well. So how do we then uh, prepare for uncertainty? And we know, and what we've learned in all of our strategic planning efforts, that the, the only constant is change in this business. And as we looked out in the future to try to forecast out in the future, uh, we saw a great deal of uncertainty. But with that, as I said earlier, a lot of opportunity. So lastly, uh, let me just sum up here with, uh, with the, what we're trying to do. As I was uh, stuck in traffic one day in Washington, D.C., I was in Los Angeles yesterday and this morning. The traffic in Los Angeles is a lot worse than Washington, D.C. <laughs> and D.C. is pretty bad traffic. Uh, but this is uh, right across the street from the, uh, the, the White House, the back side of the White House. It's uh, right next to the mall. It, it's uh, on the Department of Commerce building. And as I stopped in traffic, I looked up and saw this quote from George Washington. I thought, well, that's, that is a pretty good quote about commerce. Let us raise a standard to which the wise and honest can repair. And standard of performance of commerce, you could talk that. Here's, a, here's your university standard right here. In, you know, in the, being the military, in war, they carry the standard in front of them. So you follow that standard. So let us raise a standard to which the wise and honest can repair. That means can follow, can come to. Well, I went to the great font of all knowledge in Google and found out that uh, this had nothing to do with commerce. Uh, what George Washington, or General Washington, was saying at the time, it was in May of 1787, and it was the beginning of the, what they called then the Federal Convention, 
what we now call the Constitutional Convention. So a group of gentlemen were chartered to go to Philadelphia and Independence Hall and convene uh, to, with the charter to revise the Articles of Confederation. And uh, you probably know what happened at that point. Uh, George Washington stood up and said with a small group and said, that's not good enough. And he's, he began this quote by saying, if to please the people we offer what we ourselves disprove, how can we afterwards defend our work? So what he was saying, if we're here just to please the people, then let's go ahead and revise the Articles of Confederation. But what he was trying to do was say, that's not good enough, because we can't then defend that work. He said, let us raise a standard to which the wise and honest can repair. So in other words, he said, let's throw out the Articles of Confederation. Let's develop a new constitution for the United States of America. So uh, I'm not uh, comparing the work that we do to George Washington and the, the work, the founding, our founding fathers, but, and we quite haven't thrown out everything the Corps has done, uh, but we are greatly transforming to raise a standard to which people can look to us and we can work with all of our partners and stakeholders to really raise the standard of performance uh, for our work and then the work that we do for the nation. Very complex and, uh, and you'll face the same challenges and more as students as you go out into the business. So just don't be satisfied uh, with mediocrity, uh, but, uh, but go out and really raise the standard of performance of any organization that you join. So. That's sort of a summary of what the core looks like, uh, what kind of challenges we're facing, and what we're trying to do about it. And I think what I'd like to do now is take some questions if we can. Thank you very much, General Riley, for giving us that glimpse of the challenges that you, you face. To give me a my challenge is to look through these, and to give me a second to do that, I'm going to ask Shankar to ask the first question. Can we turn the screen off? Uh, the, the projector? Oh, just go to the next slide. That makes it even easier. Right. Great. Right. Just ask this and not use the microphone. Is that acceptable? So you talked about the, Arm, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers' responsibilities and critical infrastructure protection. I'd like to know sort of what your what, what your posture is, especially in relation to the protection of the water infrastructures? Uh, yeah, of course, after 9-11 and water infrastructure, we own a lot of locks and dams, over 650 uh, dams. So we, we tightened up security on all of our facilities uh, pretty quickly. But what we found is there are a lot of people that live in those communities that like to come visit the locks and dams. I mean, especially those small communities, when they have family in, they said, let's go to the lock and watch them pass some ships. So we had to reopen some of those uh, to the public. But we built uh, uh, public uh, visitor centers that are much nicer now, and actually uh, uh, visitors platforms that they can view some of our work. So uh, when it comes to the security, physical security of the water. Now, uh, and the phys physical security of the lock so the people that can get to a lock. Now, but as you're moving a barge through a lock, uh, people will say, well, you have a lot greater risk of that barge. If somebody packed that barge with some explosive of, of damage in the lock, then you lose all of that water pool in that, uh, in that river basin. So uh, that's where we work with the Coast Guard, and who, work, who is now assigned to the Department of Homeland Security. So it's really, we have a piece of it, uh, but not, uh, not the total piece. So we work with all of the local police uh, authorities, the state authorities, and the federal authorities uh, to ensure that we, we do that physical security of the, of the water as well. Another example, probably you wouldn't think of in physical security, but the uh, Asian carp is a pretty mean fish. Uh, it was brought in by, uh, by foreigners who uh, used it, to, who eat it. And, uh, and they were farming it down in, uh, in lower Mississippi. Well, when it flooded, it of course got into the rivers. And now the Asian carp is up near Chicago. And it's about ready to move into Lake Michigan. So we've just been funded to, I mean, we just completed two electronic fish barriers in the Chicago uh, Sanitary and Ship Canal, uh, which uh, is a charge in the water that uh, are supposed to stop the Asian carp from going through. 
So we've had to work closely, of course, with all the authorities and, uh, and uh, the Coast Guard, especially as they move uh, vessels through there. So a lot of work going on, multi-agency effort when it comes to security of, of water resources. And EPA, of course, looking at the water quality aspect of water security, whether somebody could dump something in the water to destroy the water quality of it. Yes. Thanks. Well, you mentioned um, a little bit about this, but we have two questions really concerned with how you communicate risk to communities. And uh, could you say a little bit more about? Uh, sure. The, uh, it was a very difficult challenge uh, post uh, Katrina in, in building the system that we're building now to lower the risk in New Orleans. And so uh, when the mayor uh, came up to visit me and, and, and the city council and, and some of the parish presidents, uh, I told them in, that in about a month, and this was in uh, 2006, uh, that we were, oh, 2007. Uh, that we were about to issue uh, risk maps. I showed a picture of them that, that was in the newspaper uh, to tell them what their risk of flooding would be. Uh, the, the initial reaction was, well, not real kind. They, they said, you know, there was big concern if, if uh, you don't, to scare the people in New Orleans. They're trying to rebuild the city and don't scare them. Well, I, I told them my job was, my responsibilities were public safety. And, uh, but I committed to them at that time, we'll work with you over the next three or four months uh, to, uh, to communicate that risk to the people of New Orleans. So what we did is we, we I assigned a lieutenant colonel of New Orleans and a, and a staff, and he worked over a three-month period with all of the, the business councils, uh, all of the city and parish councils, uh, with the uh, newspapers, and uh, we, we taught the newspapers how to write about it. Uh, we gave them all of the uh, maps to show the risk of flooding, uh, the 2 percent chance every year, or the one 10 percent chance, or the 1 percent chance every year of flooding, and so, and then we worked with uh, uh, Google and put it on Google Maps, so you could type in the address of your home, you could zoom down to your home and see what the percent chance of risk was of flooding every year in the home you live in. So, but that was the engineering solution to risk. So it, it tells people. Okay, I can have, and this is from all storms, not just a 100-year storm or a 400-year storm like Katrina. So the challenge was, how do you get them to understand that risk? They said, okay, I got it. I might have a foot of water in my home uh, over maybe a, over the period of a mortgage. Uh, but the challenge was, uh, uh, well, one of the things we we there's a great body of work about comparable risk out there. So. The comparable risk of one in one percent chance was catching a foul ball at a baseball game. Who, who in here has ever caught a foul ball at a baseball game? Okay, we got two or three. So maybe that's about right, one in a hundred. But people really don't understand that. I've never caught one. So if I lived in the home, I'd say, I never caught one. I'm not going to get hit by a flood. Uh, so uh, when we, uh, we we were crossing, you know, when we parked today, we, we were crossing the street on Hearst Avenue and the, and the light turned red, so we, let, we said we'd better stop. So we stopped and we waited for a green light. Well, we made a risk decision. We assessed our risk and said we're not going to take that risk. Uh, but, you know, you've, you've all been at, a, at an intersection where the light's red and maybe not many cars are coming and then one person goes across, right? And then maybe a second one goes, and then what happens? Nearly everybody else follows. So, so you can, we made a risk calculation in our heads. We didn't know what the percentage was. We didn't know if it was one in 100. But we made a general risk calculation. But then you have to apply the societal impact to that risk. And once you see somebody move, then your societal risk calculation changes, doesn't it? So that's the great challenge. And how do you communicate flood risk or risk of an earthquake. Who, how many know what your earthquake risk right here risk is uh, just 100 meters from the Hayward Fault? Who went to the football game recently? <laughs> yeah, Hayward Fault goes right through the stadium. So you, you made a risk calculation by going to that. All right, uh, thank you. Then the, we have a couple of questions that are to do with uh, sustainability and, and how, how do you know 
when you've achieved a sustainable solution to a problem, and maybe you could compare that with with uh, previous efforts, with uh, your your new and broader mission to include the environmental effects in in solutions to problems. Yeah, I don't. Uh I don't know if we'll ever know that, but you can know it through cost, certainly. You can know it through a measurement of cost, how much money you're spending. Uh, and then if the environment changes, you can measure it through, uh, do you have to go back and retrofit uh, the structure? Uh, and so uh, you can, ha you can ha put some measurements in place to measure your sustainability, the energy cost over time of a f facility. And then do you need to draw on power or can it produce power? Can you lower the, the energy requirement? Uh, for a water system, a wetland, is that sustainable? Do you have to add uh, sediment to it, which requires another structure? Uh, on the first slide, the title slide, you saw the picture of a wetland. That was the Kissimmee River in Florida. Uh, 50 years ago, Congress asked us to, uh, to provide flood control for Florida. So we did that very, very successfully. Uh, and and the, in the 2004 hurricane season, when they had uh, Charlie, Gene, Francis, and Ivan hit, they didn't have any floods, because that flood control system worked dramatically well. But what we did is we, we had great damage to the environment. So we, we, we plumbed the Everglades to prevent floods uh, but it wasn't sustainable at all. And so we're now going back, what you saw, the Kissimmee River, which we had dug a straight channel to, to get the flood waters out of there. Now you'll see uh, a meandering channel that has, within a matter of two years, has, has significantly grown uh, wetlands. So we, we know we can now provide, we know how we have ways of providing uh, flood control in a much more sustainable way. When I visited the Netherlands, uh, we talked about what they've done. And they have a levee system in the Netherlands. And you know the windmills. What are the windmills for? Windmills are for pumping water because they're, they're living in wetlands. They built into the wetlands just as they did down in New Orleans. And so they have an a area protected by levees. Uh, but the area inside the levee is lower than the area outside the levee. You have the same thing in New Orleans. They've kept pumping the water inside the levees and it subsides. So it's not sustainable. So uh, when you alter your, the environment, it takes greater and greater amount of energy to sustain that alteration. So and that's what they found in, in, uh, in New Orleans. That's what they found in the Netherlands. That's what you'll, you'll find in Sacramento. When you alter the system, your choice is to move the people out or build higher levees or replumb the river. And so it's not a very sustainable way. So right. it's difficult to sustain because every time you change it. But you, you raised a, an, an interesting connection there that water supply and, and uh, power and en energy use are, are intimately connected and can't really be disentangled. Correct. Um, not surprisingly, perhaps, given our circumstances, we have two financial questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask my They really re relate to the degree of autonomy of the, of the Corps and, and how you manage um, your multi-year projects given an annual appropriations mm -hmm. cycle. Uh, very well. Uh, in the military program, it's managed very well because all the military infrastructure is funded, fully funded up front. So, if we're building a, uh, a base, like Fort Bliss, Bliss, Texas, we're moving a couple of brigades to Fort Bliss, Texas. Uh, uh, over a period of five years, we will, on the average, have one, one building every week completed at Fort Bliss. So over, over, over uh, 250 buildings at Fort Bliss we're building over the next five years. So that's one building every week. But that's, that's funded all up front by the Base Realignment and Closure Act. So, we know we can schedule that very easily, and we can complete the work on schedule. It's, of course, very dependent on the economy. Recently, uh, all the bids are coming in very low because everybody's scrambling for work, so we have more money. Uh, when material costs went up a couple years ago, when China was sucking in all the steel in the world, all our bids, uh, of course, went up, so we have a challenge here. Now, the Civil Works funded program is, is different. That's funded directly from Congress. Uh, 
and they decide every year whether or not to fund the construction project for the follow-on year and how much to fund it. So it's not a really good funding model uh, because we'll have a construction project underway, uh, but then we won't know until, the, until close to the end of the year before the next year, or maybe if there's a continuing resolution many months into the year, how much money we're going to get for that year. So it's very, very difficult in our civil works program. And it drives our cost up substantially because of we don't have that full funding model. And it's, although it is uh, the money we do get is multi-year money, uh, we can move it from year to year, uh, but we can't move it from project to project. Uh, and, and following on from that, there's a question about when you encounter political roadblocks to projects that you think are, are essential and how you react to that. Uh, I think, uh, well, let me give you an example in, in New Orleans. When we were uh, back about 20 years ago, uh, we proposed a gate at the lake of Lake Pontchartrain, uh, a gate for those interior canals to block the water if a hurricane ever come, to block the water from getting into the city. Uh, but the local levee board, uh, the reason you have those canals is to pump water out during a rainstorm because the bowl fills up and you've got to pump the water out. So there's a large system of pumps in New Orleans. Uh, they said, no, we have, to leave the gate, we have to leave that canal open so we can pump the water out. Uh, but we said, no, the greatest risk is from a hurricane. You may get a couple of feet of flooding from rainfall, which you can't pump out, but the greater risk is if water gets in those canals and then overtops, which we saw in Katrina. So uh, the local levy board went to the, uh, and got legislation to, uh, in the legislation, describe and fund the Corps of Engineers to build uh, uh, higher flood walls along the canal and not put a gate at the lake as we had recommended. So the White House said, okay, we're, you're not going to take our recommendation, so we won't budget for that project. So the Congress had to add funds every year, but it was in the law, so the law said to do it. Uh, we got monies appropriated to do it, so we built it that way, but it was against our recommendation. So. Uh, if we had to do, if that same instance came again, what I've told our folks is, and what we couldn't do then is we couldn't describe the risk to the people. And so now we have a greater ability to say, uh, here's the risk of doing that, and here's the risk to you local sponsors, here's the flood risk, and here's, and then describe the Congress, uh, allow the risk decision to be made by Congress, whereas previously uh, they didn't have enough information to make a decision about what the risk was. Dean Walsh, do you have a, any specific questions or Professor Alvarez calling? Yes. Yes. Um, if you wanted to give some advice to an educational institution that was educating future engineers to carry out this infrastructure improvement we're going to have to form in the next several years, what sort of advice would you give? I, I think uh, probably this, what we're struggling with right now is how to articulate the need. I mean, uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers can s put a scary bill of $2.2 trillion on the table. Uh, but that doesn't mean a lot, really doesn't. Uh, I mean, that doesn't get you what you need to, uh, to repair the infrastructure. So we've got to come up, I think, with a better methodology to really describe uh, what the risk is to the future of the nation uh, because this infrastructure is not repaired. And then you get into the what I've got Todd here for is multi-criteria, multi-attribute decision making of all the functions and where this money could be spent and all the trade-offs. So uh, I'd say we all need a lot of help in that when it comes to federal government, probably state government as well. And then you could compare infrastructure spending to healthcare spending. You could go even one step further. Uh, how do you articulate uh, where you'll get, where the greatest investment uh, decision can be made? So. That's awfully general. I'm not sure if I hit on that well at all, but uh, I think that's our greatest challenge. Ah, Dean Walsh. Uh, I have a question about climate change and inundation and local control, um, which in some ways relates back to your New Orleans example. Uh, given the scenarios that we've seen, for example, for the West Coast, California and the Pacific Institute did a major study looking at likely inundation scenarios. Um, the challenges for, to local communities are huge, and mm -hmm. there are challenges uh, with, you know, in which the core will be intimately uh, involved. 
and uh, and yet there's a, such a long tradition of local home rule and land use control, and um, seemingly a very you know, inability to actually make bold moves. And I'm wondering if the Corps has been thinking about how to partner and collaborate with all those local jurisdictions in a way um, that can actually make uh, lead to some uh, lowered risk and also probably some bold action mm -hmm. given what is likely to happen. Uh, we prepared a white paper a few years ago on how to, uh, and I, I don't re quite recall the title of it, but it, it talked about shared responsibility and how do we uh, work together to buy down risk. And, if you, and it had a simple, pretty simple chart, you know, it, which is a step-down chart. And it, it started at the top on the uh, y-axis with the uh, risk, and then across the x-axis, the different steps you can take to buy down risk. And some of those were uh, state actions, such as uh, building codes. That's a state responsibility. So you can have codes which uh, flood-proof your home or wind-proof your home if you're in a hurricane-prone area. Prone area. Uh, some of those are local responsibilities, uh, zoning laws, for instance. Do you zone in or out of a floodplain? Uh, some of those are individual actions, such as a, uh, a uh, evacuation plan. Could be a community action, but it's also an individual responsibility. If you're in a flood-prone area, in a prone area such as an Atomas, do you put an ax in your attic? Do you have a rowboat in your garage? Uh, how well you're prepared with food and water? Uh, to act that. And then one of those actions is also a levy. It could be a higher level, which could be a federal responsibility. Then another action, action to buy down risk is uh, federal insurance, flood insurance, or your own insurance. So the whole idea was uh, we all share in the responsibility to buy down risk, to lower it. And then at the bottom of that, there was still a residual risk. It didn't go down to the bottom where you completely remove all risk. You can't do that. There's always a residual risk that you have to deal with it. And then how do you get people to understand that residual risk and, and make it meaningful to them so they can make a decision on whether they work there or live there or play there. So we're working on this whole idea of uh, shared responsibility. Thanks. Well, I think we've made General Riley work quite hard uh, enough for one day. Yeah. And uh, I think we should thank him again for giving us a glimpse into uh, his world. Thank you very much. Thank you.